Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see my slide now? Yeah, I get started. Slides okay. in and you're sounding great. Okay, perfect. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you. And uh, I've got a lot that I want to cover in the next uh, 25 minutes. So I'm going to just get started. So <clears throat> a few years ago, this company was in the news, uh, Maersk. Uh, they were the world's largest shipping conglomerate. Uh, as you can see here, very, very large. And, and they're responsible for about a fifth of the world's shipping capacity. And they had a really bad day on June 27, 2017. And uh, not sure if, if uh, any of you remember what happened then, but this is what their employees experienced. Their computers started to display a screen like this. And what had happened is that not pet yeah, malware uh, struck uh, Maersk. And it infected 4,000 of their servers, 45,000 PCs, basically destroying all the data that they had. So it took them multiple weeks to, to re, uh, restart and restore from backups, but this impacted their entire operation. Uh, their, their voice over IP phone stopped working. Uh, their ships were out, that were out in the ocean stopped uh, moving because their navigations went down. Port terminal gates stopped going up and down so, so customers couldn't deliver their goods or get their goods from their, their ports. And it disrupted customers all around the globe. Uh, it took them about 10 days to start to bring things back up. They had to do it from backups. And uh, their internal, their accountants uh, basically arrived at a $300 million cost to them. But most external experts uh, believe that it was much, much higher than $300 million for this much downtime for this company. So huge situation for them. But it didn't affect just Maersk. It affected these other companies. My brother works for Mer Merck pharmaceuticals. And at the same time, I remember hearing that he couldn't go to work because uh, their computer systems were down and impacting um, uh, physical security systems and, and uh, computers and, and all of that. So uh, it impacted a, a subsidiary of FedEx in, the, in Europe and uh, some of these other well-known international companies. All in all, it was about $10 billion of estimated damages around the world. So huge situation. And how did it happen? So after investigation, basically this problem got um, linked back to a small Ukrainian business as a family owned business called Link OS. <clears throat> and they basically provide TurboTax like software, but for Ukrainian, uh, for Ukrainian businesses. So every business that, every company that does business in the Ukraine, they needed to use this particular software package. And we all know what's been going on politically between uh, the Ukraine and Russia. And what had happened is Russian hackers had uh, infected Link OS with not Notpetya, and that in turn in, uh, infected all of these companies. And it was a very uh, virulent um, piece of malware, and that's why it, it impacted so many companies and it impacted them extremely quickly. Uh, there was a, an account for, for Maersk that they were literally trying to go around to every every office and unplug their computers and they still, you know, couldn't, couldn't stop it. So you have to ask, how did, how did this happen? And, you know, if, if, if Link OS was using code signing, if Maersk uh, was vetting the software that, that was being installed on their servers, they should have been using code signing. And so obviously there, there's a failure of some sort and it, it had $10 billion worth of consequences around the world. So we got to think about the risk. And, and I'm always one who, who likes to think about the risk. And there, there are basically two sides of the same coin. And, you know, as, as a group of, of InfoSec professionals, it's, you know, which, which of these are more, um, would be more urgent for your business? You know, are, is your business more like LinkOS and you're providing software to customers and so you're therefore concerned about the risk of what happened to LinkOS impacting your business and you infecting your customers? I mean, that, that would be really bad, especially if you're, uh, a tech, uh, software tech kind of company? Or are you more concerned about uh, the risks that you might have that Maersk had where they had a disruption of their business operations? Again, if that happened and your business was down for 10 days, uh, it, it's going to be extremely disruptive and extremely costly. And, and frankly, I'm concerned about both. And I talk to customers and, and obviously, you know, they, they'll, depending on their business, they might be more concerned about one or the other. But it's, it's a lot here for you to think about. And, and I know code signing doesn't always come to top of mind when you're thinking about the risks that you have to uh, contend with on a daily basis, but 
this is a great example where uh, it, it's done some, it did some tremendous damage. And this leads us to a, to a simple fact today. Software supply chains are more, more vulnerable than ever. And, and why is that? And the first is, is that we're all experiencing digital transformation. So our businesses are relying on software more than they ever have. Our employees are downloading software from the internet. Uh, sometimes we know about it, sometimes we don't. And every time they download it, we run a risk of, of infecting our systems with malware. Uh, our software infrastructure comes from many different suppliers. I mean, at, at the company that I work for, it's a fairly small company, but we probably have between 100 and 150 different software suppliers uh, in terms of the applications that we use for our business operations, as well as open source libraries that we use in our product and uh, other libraries and software that we use in our product. And then finally, we, we get the issue where cyber criminals are now more active and creative than they've ever been. And that's really what the, the, uh, the rest of this talk is about is, is how are they doing it and what can we do to, to stop that? And, and Maersk was just one example. I mean, this has been going on for a while. Just last year, uh, the Taiwanese uh, computer manufacturer Asus had a, a situation where uh, hackers uh, discovered some of their private code signing certificates. Uh, they inserted malware into legitimate um, ASUS software updates, and then re-signed it with ASUS's private code signing keys. And this got pushed out. And I'm going to talk about uh, that particular incident in, in more detail in just a few minutes. But, you know, we think back a few years even before that, there was issues around Stuxnet and what happened in, in Iran and, and their, um, their uh, nuclear uh, processing uh, equipment. And if you look on, on the dark web, code signing certificates and, and keys are a hot commodity, but especially if they come from a trusted brand name. So, you know, if, you're, if you work for a company where the brand is, is highly recognizable and uh, someone gets a hold of your code signing certificates, basically anything can be signed. And uh, cyber criminals know that and they sell them uh, on, on the dark web. Uh, McAfee did a uh, research project a few years ago, and at that point in time, so I think this was 19, uh, 2018, they discovered 22 and a half million pieces of malware that, that had been signed with either stolen or forged code signing certificates and credentials. I mean, that's a lot of malware out there uh, that's being signed from uh, using legitimate uh, code signing credentials. So I started this off with a story because I really wanted you guys to, to take notice that this is a, a big, big concern for us, all of us in InfoSec, that we, we have to care about this. And uh, what we see frequently when we talk to our customers is it's not always a high priority issue. So the rest of the, the time that I have, I'm going to um, just give a really quick refresher of what code signing is, what challenges we see and we hear about from our customers when they try to do code signing and, and protect those, those credentials. And then I have some, some tips for how you can do that uh, moving forward. And then finally, I'll give, give us some time to, uh, for me to answer some questions if I can. So what is code signing? Really simply, it's just a digital, a digital signature that we use to sign computer executables. And a computer executable can be anything like an application, a mobile app, uh, a disk image, uh, drivers, firmware. Uh, if it runs on a computing device, it's considered code and, and that code can be signed. And, and it does two things. One is it verifies, or it's supposed to verify the author's identity. So if I work for company XYZ and I sign a piece of code with company's XYZ co-signing certificate, everyone out in the world needs to be able to trust that really did come from, from company XYZ. And furthermore, it ensures that that piece of code doesn't get modified in route between when we release it and when someone actually downloads it and installs it. So it, it's, it's basically meant to uh, protect from a malware from being inserted into a legitimate uh, a piece of software. So that's what uh, code signing is in a nutshell. And you can kind of think of it as a birth certificate for the software. So, you know, we spend months and months uh, developing software and at some point we want to release it. It's like the birth of it. And then the, the code signing certificate is, is like the birth certificate saying, yes, you can trust it. It comes from us and it hasn't been modified by anyone else. And then we think about, okay, an organization, who's responsible for, for code signing? Uh, and, and this varies widely. Some, some companies, they leave it up to their software developers because they're developing so much software so quickly. They have uh, really, really uh, aggressive schedules and it 
just uh, there's not no visibility to the InfoSec team that code signing is going on. And if the InfoSec team did it, they may not be able to keep up. Um, if it's done by the development side of the house, they're probably using either build engineers to run a code signing script, or they're actually doing it as part of their build infrastructure. So I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you probably have companies that are embracing DevOps and, and that's all driven through automation. So it's those scripts that are actually doing, doing the code signing. But then there are some, com some companies who take a different approach and they basically wanna centralize code signing because they understand the risk of those keys becoming, um, uh, getting out into the wild. So they have either their PKI team or their InfoSec team be responsible for all code signing operations. And, and life, like in life, everything's a balance between uh, positives and, and cons for, for these ways of doing it. In general, if, if developers are, are, are signing code, they're gonna be doing it on either their, their own personal workstation or laptop, they're gonna be do, doing it on a web server, uh, a build server, or maybe even in the cloud. And then obviously if the PKI team's uh, signing code, it's, it's done in a secure vault. We have one customer that uh, this secure lab isn't even connected to the, their internal network. It's completely isolated and they actually have to take physical media into this locked room to do the code signing operations. And obviously if uh, they do that, it can't be very fast. So when we look at the pros and cons, if it's done by the software developers, it's gonna be extremely fast. It's gonna meet the demands of business, but it's likely to be very insecure because um, most software developers do not appreciate the risk around code signing, and especially if it's not protected. So they'll do what's convenient for them. They'll, they'll choose to do things that makes their job go faster and for them to be able to put out software faster. On the other hand, if you, you know, have the InfoSec team doing it, it's gonna be highly secure. They understand the risk. They wanna protect it, uh, protect those credentials, but it's gonna be extremely slow. You know, it's going to, you know someone's gonna to have to take a, a USB flash stick and run from the development side of the, the building to the InfoSec room. Uh, so extremely slow. And both of these you know, have pretty serious and significant disadvantages. And, and that's really what, as we think about the right solution, we, we have to be able to balance, balance both. So let's talk about some of the challenges and the risks that organizations have. I'm going to point out this particular piece of uh, literature. It's a, it's a paper from uh, the SANS Institute, and it is really enlightening. Um, it's a great, great read. It's very short. But basically what it outlines is that, yes, code signing is so effective that now cyber criminals are attacking the code signing infrastructure. So they're looking for those private keys. And once they have that, they're able to pivot and then actually attack the code signing system itself. So this is bad. They can either steal those keys or they can compromise those code signing servers. And in this quote, uh, I, I found really powerful. It's not an exaggeration to consider private code signing keys as the keys to the business's kingdom. Now think about that and, and let me explain why I think this is so profound. Um, a, when you sign a piece of code, as long as it was signed with a valid certificate at the time that it was signed and it points to a timestamp server that, that has a valid timestamp, that piece of code is gonna be installable for all time. So think about this, if, if a, a hacker signs a piece of malware with one of your valid code signing certificates, even if you revoke that, it's still gonna be installable and it's still gonna look like it comes from your organization. And unlike you know, what we fi might find with TLS or SSL certificates and you know, they expire after a certain period of time, so it, it kind of minimizes the damage done and, and it's also only good for a particular IP address. Um, code signing keys, any piece of software could be signed with that if uh, the hacker has the, the private code signing key. So let's talk about the, the some specific challenges. The biggest one is private key sprawl, and unprotected private keys. And when I say that, what I mean is that it's that scenario where developers have access to the private keys and they decide to put them wherever it's convenient to them, on their laptop, on a sticky note in, in, on, in their desk, uh, on a build server, web server, you name it. Uh, if once you hand out a private code signing key, it's out there for pretty much forever, uh, usable for pretty much forever. So let's uh, look at this in a little bit more detail. Obviously, if keys are not protected, they're gonna be uh, prone to theft or misuse. And uh, really, as, as I've said, it's their unbound risk around this is that you just don't know where they're stored, you don't know who has access to them, who's made copies, who's reused them, things like that. 
And there's a great example, and this is the example with the uh, ASUS computers. And I wanted to walk through how this happened uh, because I think it, it might be enlightening uh, for you to understand uh, the, the severity of, of what happens when you, you do have private keys sprawl and um, the private uh, keys end up in places where they're not supposed to. So with, with ASUS, like with most computer manufacturers, they produced drivers and they produced updates to drivers that they would push out automatically to all of their customers. After all, that's the security conscious thing to always uh, plug security gaps with updates to, to software. And they did that, it was done automatically. Most people have their systems configured to where as long as it has a valid code signing signature, it's their operating system's going to install it. But one of the things that ASUS did that was really unusual, and again, a great example of private key sprawl, is that they had private code signing keys on this update server. And uh, that is extremely poor, bad practice. They should not be doing that, but they did it. At least two keys were found. Hackers were able to break into the system, and it was not too hard because it is, you know, it's, all, it's connected to the internet because it's uh, their web update server. They browsed around to see what they could find. They found these two private code signing keys. And then what did they do? They inserted malware into ASUS's update. So it's a legitimate update. They added their malware to it. If they didn't have access to those private keys, nothing would have happened. Their customers' computers would have rejected it because it would have been an unsigned uh, executable or it would have been a, a signed executable but with, with a valid, uh, invalid signature. But they found these keys, so they were able to sign their uh, malware and the, the, the infected update. And then that got pushed out and it infected ASUS's customers. And uh, it was an estimate of, of about a million computers were impacted. So again, if you're in, in the business to where you're delivering software to your customers, you have to think about what would this mean to your business if you infected millions or a million customers with, with malware. Uh, and the scary thing is that ASUS didn't know about this for months. They didn't realize that this had happened. And it was only after uh, a, a malware company, I, I think it was um, Kaspersky discovered this and uh, then reported it to ASUS. But I bet you uh, there were some serious consequences at that company for allowing private code signing keys to be on their, their update server. <clears throat> so what does this mean from, their, from a business standpoint? And I, I know a lot of us, you know, you aren't really thinking about things in terms of, you know, this is what my company's revenue is, but it, it impacted their stock price, it impacted their revenue, impacted their market share. And it, it, it made their customers trust them less. And uh, perhaps there's some liability issues there where, you know, customers were asking for, for money in return of being, being uh, infected. And uh, depending on the, the segments of the market that they work at, there could have been regulatory fines as well. So pretty serious consequences. So that's private key sprawl. Another challenge that many companies have today with code signing is, is lack of policy enforcement. So, you know, I'm sure we, we all know what's the right thing to do uh, in terms of policy. Well, don't keep those, don't let the private code signing keys outside of a secure location, uh, require some level of approval before they get used, um, things like that, a certain uh, encryption strength. And uh, I, I talk frequently with many customers and, and they do have those policies defined, they have them written down, you know, great little manuals sitting on their desk. But if there's no way to enforce that, then people are, are finding ways to bypass that policy. So if you don't have the ability to enforce policy, and when I say the ability to enforce it, it's, it's an automation around being able to enforce it. People are gonna figure out ways to bypass what you have in place because it's less convenient for them and then you'll end up with code sign, signing uh, challenges. And there's also this issue of lack of global, global visibility. <clears throat> so if you're on an InfoSec team for even a large company with thousands of employees, you probably, your group is not that large, maybe 10, 15, maybe 50 people at the most. But if you think about how many people in your organization is actually writing code and then that code's getting signed, it's, it's happening all around the globe. And uh, you probably don't have visibility into everything that's going on. But if there is a breach of some sort, like with what happened with ASUS or, um, or with Maersk, who's, what's gonna happen? They're gonna come to your team and say, how did you let this happen? So it's really imperative that, that we do get global visibility. We need to understand things like what code signing certificates are being used, what uh, 
he says the software used those code signing certificates when they got signed. Uh, who did a code signing operation? It's things like that. So without that global visibility, it's really hard for you to even gauge the uh, magnitude of the risk that, that your organization has. And then we also have to deal with rogue development teams. I'm an uh, old software developer. That, that's my background. And really, you know, we software developers, they have so much pressure to get out new features and get out new features faster than ever before. And they're focused on testing and integrations and things like that. Security usually falls pretty low on their list of priorities. And if, if as an as a InfoSec team, we're trying to, to put process on them and say, well, you can't do things this way. You've got to go through this set of manual steps. Development teams are going to find workarounds. And we see this all the time with, with our customers, is that they find workarounds, they go rogue, and then uh, they put the company at risk because uh, they just need to be able to, to move fast with their soft releases, and they'll code sign in any way that they can. So just to, to finish up here, uh, I wanted to, to leave you guys with some tips that, that we have on, on how you can make this better for your organization. And I'll walk through each of these and just a little bit of detail. But before I do that, I want us to think about code signing a little bit differently than we think about other kinds of PKI information. Code signing is really a process. It's a pro and I say it's a process because it involves people. So these are the people that are actually doing the code signing operation. It involves things like the cert code signing certificate or the keys, and it involves activities. So it's actually you know, the, the exercise of actually running that code signing command to, to, sign the, to create the digital signature for that piece of code. And if there is a failure in any of these areas, so if, 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 there's, if this is insecure, if we can't control who has access, if we can't control the actual keys, if we can't control what gets signed, that means the entire thing's gonna a fail and there's gonna be a, a vulnerability across the board. So as we think about protecting code signing, we have to think about how do we do that in, uh, in terms of securing the entire process. And that's what these best practices are centered around is, is how can we secure that process? So first one I wanna talk about is really, uh, it's, uh, it should be obvious to all of us, it's, it's to secure those private keys. And to secure those private keys, we're either going to put them into an HSM and keep them there or into some other kind of encrypted storage to where we limit the access of who, who can get to those. And um, um, the thing is with secure storage is that if that key needs to come out of the secure storage in order to do a code signing operation, it's immediately not secure anymore because someone can easily make a copy of it. And then at that point, you know, that, that code signing key is, is, is not secured and uh, we're back at, at square one. So secured storage means they're in a safe location and that we, they never leave that location once the key gets created uh, for any reason. So the next, next best practice is uh, to provide your teams with enterprise visibility. So even if you have development teams around the world, you want to be sure that you know everything that's going on around code signing because it's an important part of, of um, uh, securing the business. You need to know who is signed, what pieces of code, when do they get signed, what build servers or what servers were used to do the signing operations, what code signing tools were used, uh, what time of day, what days of the week. All of that is really important information for you to have because it helps you to build risk trends and, and, um, and, and be able to identify um, uh, patterns that might indicate that, that a, a code signing credential is being misused. Next step is you need to, to control the process. So you, you need to be able to say, okay, only these select people can access the key. And when I say that, I don't mean they actually have the key. They just can, they can access it for a code signing operation. You need to be able to specify who should approve the use of that because that is a, a, a very important control mechanism that if I'm a developer, I shouldn't be able to use that key whenever I want to. I, you know, there should be some approval process uh, in order for me to use it because that's how critical these are. So we need to be able to say, you know, this person, this person, this person has the authority to approve the use of that particular key. If um, there are requirements around encryption strength or which certificate authorities are used or which H HSMs should be used, that should all be defined and you should be able to have a way to automate that, that uh, control. And then we need to think about an automation process that's convenient for developers. 
again, I go back to that whole notion of rogue development teams and, and they go rogue just because it's easier for them. So it really becomes important for us to find a solution that is going to make their life easier and it's going to make them want to use a solution in place. And that usually means don't make me learn something new and don't slow me down from what I normally do and allow me to work with the tools that I already use. So those all are really important to, uh, to keep those development teams happy. And then finally, you need to be able to have intelligence around, around what's going on within your, your organization on code signing. You need to, in some cases, you need to show compliance that yes, you, your policies are being followed. You do know you have visibility into every code signing operation that occurred. Uh, you know who's access what certificates and, and be able to identify risky trends that, that might indicate a problem. And then again, you know, this has to be developer friendly. And I, I'm, I'm saying this twice because it's that important. Uh, we have so many customers that, that we work with that they have tried their best to create an infrastructure that secures code signing, but it's inconvenient for their developers. And so their developers will grumble for a while and then eventually they just stop using it. And um, uh, when that happens, they're back to square one of, of having an insecure process. And finally, I just want to leave you with this uh, white paper. It's, it's really, really useful. Uh, a lot of what I covered in the best practices comes directly from this. It's a NIST paper that talks about what security considerations your organization should, should put into place to protect code signing. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, wish you all a, a great weekend. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions. Okay, Eddie, I think there's one question for you in the Q&A. It's about revoking code signing keys. Yes. So you, you could revoke the certificate, but the problem is, is that if that certificate has been used to sign a piece of code and, that, and a timestamp was used, then even though you've revoked it, it's still going to be a valid piece of code that's going to, be, have, that's going to have a valid signature. That's the whole reason why this is so scary for me at least, that um, you, know, you don't take all the precautions and then the, your key gets out, your private key gets out, someone signs some malware with it, there's really nothing you can do at that point. 